from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same. He's worthy to be praised. talk again from the subject from humiliation to exaltation from humiliation to exaltation Paul starts this pericope in verse number five as he cautions and exhorts the Christian believer to let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but took upon himself the form of a slave. And he came in the likeness of men. He did not give up being God when he became man. His, his incarnation was not about taking off divinity. It was about putting on humanity. He lowered himself. He poured himself into human flesh. He became what we are that we might become what he is. And he was humble even unto death. Jesus' name suggests his death. For the angel said, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And the only way for us to be saved, there had to be the shedding of blood. Wish they had a Bible reader here. Well, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The cross becomes the symbol of the Christian religion. For without the cross, Christianity is an enigma and our faith is an empty hope. We do not bow, we do not genuflect before a crucifix. Because a crucifix has affixed to it a dead Jesus. We don't worship a dead Jesus. We worship a living savior. He's sovereign. He's servant. He's son. He's savior. The cross is empty. Because we don't leave Christ dead on the cross. Because a dead Jesus leads to a dead religion. A dead church. A dead empty worship and every time we gather to worship our worship ought to be lively and dynamic and interactive and loud because we ought to make a joyful noise unto the rock of our salvation uh, Jesus died uh, he, he did die but we don't leave him on the cross. Help me preach if you can. 
We, we don't even leave him in the grave because he didn't stay dead. Early Sunday morning, he rose from the dead. But in this text, Paul says, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Christ became obedient even under death. Uh, crucifixion was painful. The flesh was ripped. Uh, agonizing pain. Hours of hanging on the cross. Asphyxiation begins. The person in two or three days eventually dies. And then there is the stigma of hanging on a cross. For the Bible says in the Old Testament, cursed is he who hangs on a tree. Jesus is on a cross. And, and Paul could handle him saying he's the son of God. Uh, Paul could handle him saying he is our Messiah. But Paul had problems when he was a Jew persecuting the church. He had problems with the cross because for the Jew, the cross is a stumbling block. Uh, to the Greek, it's foolishness. But to those who are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. My brothers and sisters, as I hurry, in order for you to understand how important the cross is, you've got to understand the Jewish sacrificial system. In the, in the sacrificial economy of the Jewish religion, uh, there had to be a blood sacrifice. Uh, I need somebody who reads the Bible uh, to help me preach right here. Uh, on the day of atonement, there were two goats. Uh, one goat was taken by the priest and he would put his hands on the head of that goat and he would confess his sins and the sins of the people. And another man would carry that goat out into the wilderness away from the tent and tabernacle of meeting and that goat would represent or become for them a scapegoat and then he would take that other he goat and shed his blood but that blood was not just put anywhere that was what was called the ark of the covenant uh, and the ark of the covenant represented the law of God where people had to stay a certain distance away from it because of their sins they could not keep the law but on the day of atonement, the high priest would come with his ceremonial garments and sprinkle the blood of that second goat on what was called the mercy seat. And the reason why we had to have a cross, because the cross represents our sins being removed. Uh, just like their sins were removed in the Old Testament at the mercy seat. When Jesus died on the cross, he removed our sin. It works like this. Uh, there was the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women, the court of the men and the court of the priests. And then there was the priest separated from the high priest. And then the high priest was separated from the holy of holies and separated from the holy of holies was the most holy. Uh, that veil in the temple where rested the mercy seat. And the priest would go behind that veil once a year, but sacrifices were made in the temple every day. Uh, the priest did not sit down because there was a constant 24-hour sacrificing of bullocks on the altar and lambs without spot or blemish and he goats because they had to constantly sacrifice for their sins. But when Christ died, the veil in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the Most Holy was rent from the top to the bottom 
knocking out forever a need for a sacrificial system and the priest no longer has to keep on making sacrifices because Christ made the sacrifice once and for all. There's no need anymore for you to go and confess your sins to no priest. I wish I had somebody to help me talk here. Uh, there is no need for you to make any penance for your sin. Uh, the, the sacrifice has already been made. Uh, the, the old debt has already been settled. The old account has already been paid. When Christ died on the cross, he removed my sin. I'm, I'm not guilty. Uh, I'm, I'm guilty. But I'm not guilty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did it, but he paid for it. I should be condemned, but he took my place. I deserve to be in hell, but he made a sacrifice on my behalf. I should have been dead, sleeping in my grave. But Jesus took my place on the cross and when Christ died for me, God no longer sees me. He sees the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The cross removes my sin. Yeah. And then the cross has a second purpose. The cross satisfies God's wrath. The wrath of God is turned against the children of disobedience because we were born with a sinful proclivity. Everything in our nature is against God. Talk back to me if you can. I don't care how pious you try to look on Sunday morning. I don't care how holy you carry on when you get into worship. Sooner or later, the real you is going to come out. You can't help yourself. You would do better if you could. Help me preach if you can. Paul, who wrote some of the Bible, says every time, not, not every now and then, not, not sometimes, but every time. Is there a witness here? I desire to do good. Evil is always present. The good that I would do the good that I'm trying to do, I find myself not even doing. Oh, wretched man, not that I was before I got saved, but that I am since I've been saved. I, w I, was, I was trying to share it with my, with my class in vacation Bible school. That the reason many people can't get saved is they think they ain't that bad. You know, salvation is for dope dealers and, and drug addicts and, 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 and prostitutes and uh, people on the street and people who live in the projects and poor folk need salvation. Uh, I'm, I'm not that, I'm, at least I'm not as bad as them. Well, that would get you to heaven if that was the yardstick. But if you're trying to measure yourself by another man or another woman, you are measuring by the wrong yardstick. If you want to see how good you are and how tall you are and how spiritual you are and how religious you are, you're standing up to the wrong, next to the wrong person if you try to stand up by me. Because you will always be doing something that I'm not doing. You are measuring by the wrong ruler. But if you want to know how really good you are, you stand up by the real standard who is Jesus Christ. And nobody in here today is worthy 
even to call on his name. I'm looking at you. I see you. You're so heavenly minded. And you answer your phone, praise the Lord. And nobody want to ask you how you're doing because you're too blessed to be stressed. And you're blessed and highly favored. And you are. All of us are blessed. Because you got up this morning, you're blessed. But wait till you get a chance. You're going to become everything you said you'd never be. I wish I had five, six honest Christians in here today who could honestly admit, Reverend, I'm trying, but I stumble every time. Reverend, I want to do better, but evil is always in my way. I have a good desire, but then I see somebody I can't stand. I really want to praise God, but I'm sitting in the wrong section in this church. I need to get up and sit by somebody I like. I don't like these people I'm sitting next to. Well, you're not here for somebody you're sitting next to. You're here because he took your sins away. You're here because he wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life. You're here because your soul has been redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Without Christ, you are at the mercy of the wrath of God. The wrath of God is on your life without Jesus Christ. Not only does the cross remove sin and satisfy God's wrath, but the cross reveals God's love. If you want to know how much God loves us, look at what he did to save us. I wish I had a witness here. He becomes one of us. He becomes like a man, yet without sin. He empties, he lowers himself. What, what, what glorious condescension, what majestic humility that God himself would become a man. He became what I am, that I might become what he is. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. So he came and paid a debt he didn't owe. He became sin, though he knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. He came to throw open wide the doors of salvation that a wretch like Terry Anderson would have a right to the tree of life. I wish I had somebody to feel that. Now, now to you people who are not that bad, that kind of talk won't make you shout. But to those of us who got some skeletons in the closet, we got some stuff that some people know about us that we hope don't come out. I wish I had some help here. There's some decisions we wish we hadn't made. There's some mistakes we wish we could go back and clean up. There's some stuff in our past that if somebody knew it, we'd have to crawl out of this church right now. But thank God that the grace of God the blood of Jesus covers my sins so that when God sees me, he doesn't really see me. But he sees the blood of Christ. And because of Christ's sacrifice, I'm not guilty. The cross, the most heinous crime ever committed, reveals as starkly as God could reveal it, how much he loves us. That word in the Bible, that verse in the Bible that, that comes to mind right now, uh, we, we, we know it, I don't even have to share it with you. You already know what I'm about to say. For God so loved the world that he gave his only 
begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Oh, brothers and sisters, the cross reveals that God will go to any length to show us how much he loves us. I wish I had a witness right here. God will, will, will turn over any stone. God will knock down any barrier. Uh, God will tear down any argument. God will root up any opinion that stands against his love for his children. He loves us. He loves us unconditionally. He loves us without restraint. He loves us without boundaries. He loves us without restriction. He loves us when we are unlovable. He loves us when we don't even call his name. He loves us when we are too sick to even pray. He loves us when nobody else loves us. When our mother and our father leave us, the Lord will come and take us up. When our husband dies, he loves us. When our wife walks out, he loves us. When our children are acting a fool, he loves us. When the world has turned against us, he loves us. When our back is up against the wall, he loves us. When we are down to our last dime, he loves us. When we don't know which way to turn, he loves us. When we can't find a job, he loves us. When our hair turns gray, he loves us. When we can't see or hear anymore, he loves us. If we have to be rolled in a wheelchair, he loves us. If somebody has to bathe and feed us, he loves us. Jesus loves me. This I know. Because the Bible tells me so. He loves me. I said he loves me. He, he, he loves me. I know ain't nothing to me. But he loves me. I've been low down in my life. But he still loves me. I've disappointed God in so many ways. But he still loves me. I wish I could take some things back that I've done. But he still loves me. That's why I shout so much. That's why I got to come to church. Jesus loves me. And I love him not because of my love for him, but because he loved me first. He died for me. And brothers and sisters, as I hurry to the close, anybody who loves me enough to die for me is worthy of my hallelujah. Anybody who takes my place on a cross is worthy of me lifting my hands. Anybody who loves me enough to go my barn and to stand in my place when I should have been the one to die, I'm going to love him for the rest of my life. Wherefore, after he was obedient to his father, wherefore, God has highly exalted him. You will help me close this, won't you? And God has given him a name that is above every name. Now for the longest time, I thought the name that God had given him was Jesus. No, 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 no that's his salvation name. That's not the name God has given him. You're going to help me close this, won't you? Because there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved except by that name Jesus. But there are titles to that name, but that's not the name God has given. Jesus is called the Son of God, but that's not the name. He's called the Son of Man, but that's not the name. He's called Messiah, but that's not the name. He's called the Anointed One. You're going to help me preach this, won't you? But that's not the name God has given him. He's called the day spring of Israel, but that's not the name. He's called the ancient of days, but that's not the name. 
I need somebody to help me preach right here. He's called the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, the bright and the morning star. But that's not the name God has given him. I wish I had somebody to help me close here. He's Adam's redeemer, Abel's vindicator. He's Abraham's sacrifice, but that's not the name. He's Noah's ark. He's Moses' bush on fire. Joshua's battle axe. Gideon's fleece, but that's not the name. He's David's music and Solomon's wisdom. Jeremiah's balm and Ezekiel's wheel, but that's not the name. He's Job's redeemer. He's Ruth's kinsman redeemer, but that's not the name. He's God's only son and Mary baby boy. He's James' older brother. He's Luke's great physician. He's Matthew's king. He's Mark's suffering servant, but that's not the name. He's the true light, John says. He's distinctive in supernatural capacity, superlative in sovereign majesty, exclusive in spiritual beauty, radiant in eternal splendor, matchless in supernal deity, but that's not the name. He's a rock in a weary land. You know that's what he is, but that's not the name. He's a bridge over troubled water. He's a doctor in a sick room, a lawyer in a courtroom, but that's not the name God has given him. Somebody knows he'll be a mother for you. Somebody else can testify he's been a father for me, but that's not the name God has given him. I'm about to get happy now, because when I think about that name, my soul just catches on fire. Jesus is a good name, but that's not the name God has given him. Every knee shall bow. Isn't that what the scripture says? Every tongue shall confess. Here it is, that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the name. He's Lord over my circumstance. Lord over my sickness. Lord over my problems. Lord over my enemies. Lord over my finance. Lord over folk who don't like me. Lord over old age. Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you for tuning in to A Call to Joy. It is our prayer that the Word of God has brought joy, strength, and faith to your life. We would love to have you as our guest at Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church, where we are exalting the Savior, equipping the saints, and evangelizing the sinner. For your convenience, we have a 7.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. worship service every Sunday morning and 7 p.m. on Tuesday nights. Lily Grove is located at 7034 Till Wester Street, Houston, Texas, 77021, or feel free to visit our website at www.lilygrove.org. Until next week, God has called us to a life of joy. Mm -hmm.